Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Hannah Berger. I'm with the Nature Conservancy here in Nebraska. And we're having some difficulties with our slides, but fortunately, I think I can get through most of my talk without them. Uh, so first, I just want to thank Water for Food for inviting me here. Um, it's really an honor to get a chance to talk about some of the work and how it touches down in Nebraska. So typically, I start my slides by putting up a picture of Rene Descartes. And you don't see it right now, but the idea behind that is that nothing that we do is in a vacuum. So we always like to think about why are we taking a systems approach to our work? And the first thing I like to say is that Descartes said, we need to divide the difficulties into as many component parts as possible to understand the problem. So this idea was about reductionism. The smaller we can get, oh, there we go. The smaller we can get, the better we can understand the system. And it was really Newton who took this idea and ran with it a few hundred years later. Newton had this idea of a clockwork universe. As long as we can bore down and really understand the fundamental parts of the system, we can wind the clock up with those basic principles and allow it to run. And this kicked off uh, a spur of really high scientific inquiry for the next few hundred years. There was this idea that as long as we could define the principles and understand it, that we can predict all things for all time throughout the universe. This is Maxwell. His name is not as well recognized, but I think his ideas resonate, especially with those of us grappling with these really complex, messy systems. And his whole idea was that you have these small influences that you can't account for, even though because they're impossible to measure or too expensive to measure, they can have these really disparate, important impacts on the system. Um, and I don't like to show a lot of graphs, but I thought I'd take the opportunity. And this is a classical uh, experiment in population biology, and it has to do with rabbits. And I bet none of you thought that you would be listening to a talk about rabbit population growth this morning, but here I am. The idea is that you could take three islands and put one rabbit, 1.01 rabbit, and 1.0001 rabbits on those three islands. And as long as you understood their population growth dynamics, let them go. And you can see that for a while, you have a pretty good idea of how many rabbits there are going to be. But when you get to the end of your extended period of time that you're measuring it, there are actually huge differences in the amount of rabbits on the island. And if your whole goal is to understand how many rabbits you're going to end up with, you somehow have to be able to distinguish among those early rabbit populations. And we know this is almost impossible. Again, not only can it be super expensive, but oftentimes we don't have the ability to measure the differences. And I always like to say that in big, messy systems full of uncertainty, there's a larger gap between what you measure and what you should be measuring. And so how can we take this information and design projects on the ground that reduce this inherent uncertainty in the system? So I think you've all seen this map. I won't dwell on it too long. Um, this is showing groundwater declines in Nebraska for a period of about five years between 2012 and 2017. The warm colors show declines and the cool colors show increases. The important thing about this is that if you change the window that you were looking, if you zoomed it to just one year, maybe 2017, or you looked over multiple decades, those colors are gonna change. So it's not that we consistently see declines or we consistently see gains, it's that the window of inference that we use matters an incredible amount for what we see on this map. Uh, this is kind of just to really emphasize this point, and this is the Palmer Drought Severity Index. This is basically drought um, in a little place in southeastern Kansas, but it's kind of indicative of the entire Great Plains, and it's going back over a thousand years, and you can see a lot of drought. I want to draw your attention, though, to the right-hand side in that bar. Those two skinny gray bars that are highlighted for droughts, those are the 1950s drought and the 1930s drought, the Dust Bowl. So this is showing us that not only is drought inevitable, but we have to manage it. Again, that frame of inference that we use to manage our water systems is much smaller than the whole drought system. And that's kind of the general background that we use to design our projects uh, at the Nature Conservancy in Nebraska. And one of those I'm going to talk briefly about today is the Central Nebraska Irrigation Project. So this project occurs in the central area of the Platte River Basin in Nebraska. And irrigators in this area generally make their irrigation decisions based on, is my neighbor watering? Do my crops look dry? Does my soil look dry? 
and do I, am I planning on going on vacation next week? Got to get some water on the crops. So effectively what we've done is we've gone to them and we said, what tools do you need to schedule irrigation so that it's closer to crop needs? Not more and not less. We worked with them to give them on-field weather stations, flow meters to track how much water they're using, and telemetry so they can turn their pivot on and off with the touch of their button on their cell phone from a remote location. So far, we have 40 producers enrolled with another 10 slated to enroll next year. It's a three-year project in sum, and using about a 15% reduction in water, we estimate that we're going to save about 9 billion liters from excess application. And this has both water quantity impacts, but then also water quality and greenhouse gas impacts. Um, it's not super well known, but groundwater tends to be super saturated with methane, and so we want to keep that methane in the ground and not exposed to the atmosphere. We also tend to see more soil and nutrient runoff with increased irrigation. So this is sort of a water quantity project, but with multiple co benefits to the system. Uh, we have four collaborators. This project is funded by Nestle, Purina, and Cargill. We're working with a natural resources district in the Central Platte who's been incredibly helpful, and the Nature Conservancy administers and runs the program. Quickly, what are the lessons learned? Technology is typically used as a fail-safe. So if we have that stationary view of systems, if we can just understand it and control it down to the very detail, we can use technology to manage away surprise. But we know that that's not possible in messy systems with intractable uncertainty. So instead, we use technology in a safe-to-fail way. We know that systems are dynamic. We know that there's going to be uncertainty. So if we can help farmers manage their water more closely with more precision, the idea is that we can give them more flexibility during times of drought and during times of too much water. So here, surprise is inevitable in the system. What matters is our ability to manage that change for beneficial outcomes. And one more important lesson learned from this, um, because I often hear that you know, farmers are motivated by the bottom line. It's about profit. And that was an assumption I had going into this program, and through my conversations with the enrolled producers, I've learned an important lesson, and that's that economics constrain, but farmers do not optimize for economics. They need enough money to survive in order to pay the bills, but if farmers are optimizing for profits, they would not be farmers. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. Warwick Palman is the farmer advisor on this. Dr. Trenton Franz is a Doherty Water for Food Institute faculty fellow who's helping us with the data analysis. And all the others listed are from the Nature Conservancy, Cargill, the Central Platte Natural Resources District, and Cargill. And with that, thank you very much.